Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much for honoring me and, and being here. Um, and teachers do not really pay attention to how many people come to their classes. And those who uh, took classes with me before, this is the least mic of my concern. If I have one student in the class, same like if I have 100 students. Um, the ajr, inshallah, will, uh, will be given from Rabbul Alameen. I want to start by um, giving everyone, inshallah, a few seconds to, to pause and, um, and, and to make a sincere... Today is the day of Jum'ah, and we're very close to Maghrib time. So I want to pause for a few seconds and uh, ask everyone, inshallah, to make dua for all our teachers, for, for the scholars of this ummah, to the founders of MCC, to the staff and volunteers, and to, to those who carry the amana of this deen upon their shoulders. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa shadu an la ilaha illallah, wa hadahu la sharika lahu, wa shadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasoolu, rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri, wa halal uqdatan min lisan yafqahu qawli. Uh, in the beginning, inshallah, I want to put here, um, you know, just, just to introduce myself without, uh, without having to say anything. Um, just give yourself a few seconds. I always prefer, for me and for anyone, to, to know the speaker, to know the instructor, to know the teacher um, who, who, who gives the speech. And I want to start by asking this question, uh, why I'm here today? Um, leaving uh, Sacramento and leaving, you know, uh, my students and, you know, on a busy day like Friday. And I think the reason here is, and this is how I can, can add to this, the concept of the amana of, of knowledge. The amana uh, that teachers always carry upon their shoulders, scholars carry upon their shoulders the concept of spreading knowledge. The best among us you are those who learn Quran and teach Quran. And I can use the same analogy with all, you know, uh, uh, Islamic sciences. Uh, those who learn the science of the Quran and teach the science of the Quran, the science of Hadith and teach the science of Hadith, right? So we can apply the same to all the, the different branches of Islamic, Islamic sciences. Um, and I, I really feel that the Muslim community, we have to work together. We have to, to share our experiences. You know, we're here two hours from Sacramento. It's, it's, it's not a big deal. We travel, people drive for three, four hours just for fun. Uh, so coming here to share uh, my humble findings after years of research, I think this is a man on my shoulders and a man on, on all the, 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 the scholars' sh shoulders. Um, and, and, you know, one of my teachers is, is here today, Saza Husai, and, you know, we always, uh, whenever we, we invite her to come to, to Sacramento, I know, coming to Sacramento for like 45 minutes or an hour, Plus, it's just gonna finish her day. <laughs> just two and a half hours, and two and a half hours back and forth, like five hours drive, and sitting with the community. So maybe for 45 minutes or one, one hour, the, the whole day is gone. But this is a blessing. Um, and after years of research, uh, I really want to, to share my findings, not only with the Sacramento community, but even with other communities. And I, I really want to, you know, there, there, in, in, in our life there are always people, they hold the microphone and they are always behind the podium. And there are others that, peace be upon him, call them al atqiya wal akhfiya They're very righteous and they always try not to be, you know, behind the podium or holding the microphone. And I feel that um, Brother Munir and, and Sister Argument I think both of them are among those, Al-Atqiyya and Al-Akhfiyya. I, I was counting today how many emails I sent and I received between, 
you know, Sister Hussai, myself, you know, Brother Munir and Sister Arjman, I counted 50 emails. 50 emails. And I asked Allah Azza to keep all these emails, inshallah, heavy on our skills on the Day of Judgment. Uh, and those are al atqiyal akhfiya. They are not seeking any light, they are not seeking any recognition, but they are always at the back putting th things together to, 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 to serve the community. And I want to ask you, who said this statement? I think I skipped one, no? Yeah. Who said this statement? Yeah, thank you. And this is an important part of, of, my, of my speech today, where um, Malcolm X said, the media is the, the, media is the, the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent. And that's power, because they control the mind of masses. And I want to ask you, who is in this room, works in the field of media? It's really important, right? So who, who in this room, who works in the, in, in, the, in, in the field of media? No one? Who wants to be in the field of media in the future. Is there any mother or father here that they encourage their, their children or even teach? Selene, are, are you raising your hand? You want to work in the media? Although it's really important, but I don't think we pay attention to the impact of media. So don't forget this slide, we'll, we'll get back to it. And here, I want to stress the concept of uh, scientific research. Because sometimes it's easy for, for, for people to write a book. And I always consider books are kind of a diary. So Brother Wafi, he has, he's, he's, he's very passionate, he's inspired by ideas. So he'll start writing down his thoughts and he will say, I think, I believe. This is my point of view. However, it comes to scientific research, you cannot use all these terminologies. Your dissertation will never pass. It has to be very academic. It has to be uh, extremely unbiased. How many professors? You know, MC, MCC community is an amazing community. How many professors we have here? I pray that we have so many professors. How many researchers? How many journalists? Writers, authors of books, poets. I, was, I had an event with Professor Hatem Bazian a couple of months ago. He's a professor at, at Berkeley. So we, we had a good time after the event. So I asked them, Professor Hatem, how many Muslim students, they are enrolled in the faculty of journalism in Berkeley? Remember the, the other slide by Malcolm X? She so told me, only one student. <laughs> Only one, with all the attack against Islam and Islamophobia and, and stereotype and discrimination, you just, you name it. Only one Muslim student decided to be a journalist. And I want to ask you another question. Who is behind the biggest research centers in the United States? Huh. Who is behind them? Who funds them? Hmm. The Jewish community. And it's all public information. If you can pinpoint the, the biggest research centers in the United States, if you dig deeper, you will find very easily, and they don't hide even this, these things. It is, or they are funded by the Jewish community. Why? Because they try, and I, I cannot blame them, to be honest with you. We have to stop blaming people. We have to blame ourselves. We have just to work hard like them. They were a minority. They're still a minority, by the way. But look at them and look at us. So instead of just keep blaming Yahud, you know, they do this, they do that. No, they, they, are, they have a cause. Agree or disagree with their cause, that's totally fine. But they work very hard for their cause. They try their best to control two things. Number one, media. Remember this one? And what the second one? Academia. That they've been working very hard. 
media and academia. The difference between dissertation and books, and I mentioned this in the beginning, dissertation has to be an, a very academic, in a very academic format. You have to support every word by what's so-called scholarly opinions. You cannot say, I think, in your dissertation. And I want to give a very important example. One of the classes that I teach is the sciences of the hadith. And Orientalists always attack Islam through the concept of there is a separation between Quran and Sunnah. And based on my teachings, I tell my students that everything in the Quran is as important as everything in the Sunnah and vice versa. You cannot say Quran comes after Sunnah. I disagree with this. We call it a Sunnah a shariha Sunnah is the, the format where we can explain the Quran. There is no ayah in the Quran that says that we have to pray Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and zero. Nothing. It's like the fundamental pillars of Islam. There is not, not a single ayah that tells us that we have to pay 2.5% as the cattle mass. Right or wrong? All the rituals of, of Siyam and Hajj, we learn this from where? From the Sunnah. So Orientalists always try to attack Islam by saying, what is the most famous book of hadith that we always extremely proud of this book? Al-Bukhari. Right? Who has Al-Bukhari at, at, at his or her house, by the way? You have? OK, perfect. At least, alhamdulillah, you have something. Shaykhuna, uh, Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn Ismail, better known as Imam al-Bukhari. When did he die? 256 Hijri. And when did peace be upon him die? Give me date. Give me year. 11 Hijri. So Orientalists always say, oh yeah, there is a huge gap between where your, when your prophet, peace be upon him, passed away and when Al-Bukhari started to compile the Sunnah, which is extremely utter lie. And there are so many scholars, they try to write books again as this. And then one of the great scholars, I teach his book, Shaykhuna uh, Dr. Muhammad Mustafa Al A'zami, an Indian scholar, moved to Egypt, moved to Mecca, moved to Qatar, studied Islam, and then went to, he became one of the professors of hadith in Mecca. And he wrote a dissertation that proved that, peace be upon him, while he was alive, he um, compiled the Sunnah. And he had a team of Sahaba just to compile the Sunnah. And he wrote all the names in his dissertation. And he cannot say, I think, I believe. No, everything he mentioned was supported by scholarly opinions. An amazing dissertation. It became a book. And I teach this book. Studies in early hadith literature. And even he mentioned that this Sahabi, peace be upon him, told, do not write the Quran. I want you to write the Sunnah. And another Sahabi, write the Sunnah and don't write the Quran for things not to be mixed up. And he proved without a shadow of a doubt that the Sunnah was compiled under the direct supervision of whom? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So whenever you read the, his dissertation, it fills your heart with confidence. Why? Because it is supported by scholarly opinions. Talk about scientific research and how we as an ummah, we need more researchers, we need more professors. So I want to ask you here, is there any pressing need to invest in researching new challenges? Do we have any new challenges in this life? I think we don't have any new challenges. Is that right? Sandra, do we have any new challenges as Muslims? I think we do have a lot. Like what? Can, can anyone raise his hand or her hand and share with us a couple of new challenges? Sister, please. Sexual deviation. What else? Atheism. Right? How about mortgage? How about moon sighting? How about... 
creating a solid curriculum for Islamic schools. Right? We have so many, so many challenges. That's why we need so many researchers. And th that was part of my khutbah today, that we have to sponsor students of knowledge. We have to sponsor scholars. Look here, as, as an immigrant myself, my wife and I, we moved five, six years ago. Our biggest objective, not only to connect our children to Islam, but look here what I put. We want them to feel safe in their connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is a huge difference here. You can push your children to be connected to, to your deen. You have to force them, do this. You finish your Quran. If you don't finish your Quran, what's going to happen? You'll be grounded. So Quran became a source of punishment. I think all of us as parents, we do this, which is wrong. We should have our children feel this safety being around Quran and the rituals of Islam. I think this is the biggest challenge. And I really wanted my children to feel safe practicing Islam and sometimes committing you know, mistakes and learn from their mistakes. But at the end of the day, they have to feel safe being connected to their deen. And then I started researching the, the, the role of religiosity in our societies. And from Western academia to even from to Islamic you know, literature, um, religiosity always boosts your confidence and increases your hope and decreases your mental health. So how to achieve this? How to bring religiosity gradually to the life of your children away from halal and the haram and Allah will punish you and there is snake in, 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 in the cupboard and this snake will do this, this and that and all this, this kind of you know, horrific you know, uh, description and how to make them feel safe opening books and learning and sometimes they pray on time sometimes they delay their prayers based on, on my research I found out that the best thing is mentorship and I'm not coming here today as an academic professor who, teach, who teaches classes and, you know, just abstract knowledge. No. We tried a couple of years ago to bring this concept of mentorship to life. And we started what's so called the Nizami program. And if you Google Terbiya Institute and you, you find Nizami program, you can read thoroughly how to introduce mentorship as a relevant commodity. How to have mentors, how to have teachers, what are the activities, what is the curriculum. And even based on my research during the last couple of years, I found out that the weapon that parents need now to keep their children connect to, to their dean and feel safe is mentorship. And I want to start here by explaining the difference between um, Mentor and teacher and big brother. Let's start with this one. Who is the mentor? Because I really want you to understand the meaning of mentor. And don't mix this with, with the teacher, by the way. Teacher is something and mentor is something else. Who has mentors here? Thank you, Brother Wood. Do you have mentors? So let's, before you answer this question, let's try to understand who is the mentor. Maybe after you, you read the description, oh yeah, now I remember that I have a mentor. Mentor is someone, can I, can I have one of the girls to come here and, and read it? Please, come. Go, go, go. Okay. Yes, use, use the microphone, please. Uh, Bismillah. Um, is someone with good character, good morals, good reputation, more knowledge and experience who is expected to nurture someone else and take care of him spiritually, physically, intellectually, socially, and emotionally. They should not be looking for mentees and 
may even make the process difficult to scare them away. They should not be self-serving. They shouldn't expect that their mentees and their family will be serving them. Gifts, network, business, fixing cars, etc. They spend a lot of time with their mentees on a very personal level. Thank you. What's your name? Zainab. Thank you, Zainab. This is the mentee. Does anyone here have a mentee or a mentor in, in, in his life? Beside Brother Wafi? Sister, do you have a mentor in your life? Do you think everything I mentioned here, perfect, mashallah. And look here, one of the things that I really love, that mentors shouldn't expect their mentees or their families to serve them. Yeah, I have a car. Can you, can you ask your dad to s s fix my car, please? You know, yeah, your, your brother works for, you know, TNT or T-Mobile. Can you get me a discount? Mentors shouldn't do these things. Sometimes... You know, teachers at, you know, public school, and, and they can ask for these things, but mentors shouldn't. Why? Because they do this first and foremost for whom? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the mentor. How about the teacher? I'm sorry, big brother. By the way, mentor is a byproduct from, big brother is a byproduct of mentor. So the more you spend time with your mentor, he, he becomes what? He becomes your big brother or big sister. You cannot call him mentor anymore. Why? Because there is this connection and attachment, bonds, strong relationship. And Allah is my witness. And I have some students here in the room. I always tell them, don't call me imam. Don't call me doctor. Call me, call me brother. Because this is where I feel the attachment. I feel that I play my role as a big brother. Matter of fact, that's where I feel that the relationship can be upgraded from being a mentor to become a big brother. Teacher is a teacher. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all our teachers, scholars, instructors, ustaz whom we have studied with. They mainly take care of their students intellectually. Who have any teachers here in the room? Please raise your hands, <laughs> right? All of us, no one should, should, shouldn't raise his or her hand. Everyone should have a teacher. But I think the question is, do you really have a mentor? Who is Al-Aliya bin Shuraik Al-Azdiya? We know her son very well. But sadly, we don't introduce the name of our mothers in our history. Who is Al-Aliya bin Shuraik al azdiya She is the mother of our great uh, scholar, Imam Malik ibn Anas. And Imam Malik is one of the founder of the Madhahib, Al-Madhab Al-Maliki. Imam Malik who uh, born 1993 Hijri and died 179 Hijri. His mother, al Ali bin Shuraik, talk about mentorship. So Imam Malik, his mentor was al rabiah one of the great mentors in Medina. Imam Malik, born, and, born, raised, died in Medina. So his mother, Zainab, told him, Ya Malik, are you going to your mentor, al rabiah Yes, I'm going to, to my mentor today. So look at the advice that she gave him. She told him, learn from his adab, before you learn from his knowledge. And that's the meaning of mentorship. You can learn from a teacher that you disagree with their principles. But it is what it is. He's your professor. He's your instructor. You don't have the, the luxury to say, oh, no, no, I, I don't like this professor. Can you change him for me? You don't have this luxury. But you have it with the mentor. So she told him, yeah, Malik, تعلم من أدبه قبل أن تتعلم من علمه. Learn from his adab, from his character, before you learn from his knowledge. And he became Imam Malik ibn Anas. رضي الله عنه وارضاه. Are we talking here about the business mentor? No. And by the way, it's very important to understand that this has nothing to do with the business mentor. And who is the business mentor, by the way? Do you have any business? Does anyone here have any business mentor? 
who works here? No one works. <laughs> do you have a business mentor? What did he do for you? I'll put, I'll put the answer here. Did he, did he accomplish these things? Pretty much, right? So he's someone, basically, that you're just a newcomer to the organization. You join the organization. So your business mentor will be someone who did these things before. He has been in, in, the, in the company for years. And he went through the same struggles and you know, duties and responsibilities. He will walk you through the process. So we're here to talk about the spiritual mentor, not the business mentor. And I always, I always try to, to explain the historical background behind everything. Why? Because if you study the Quran, you will learn easily that you cannot fully understand the ayah without what's so called, or without knowing what's so called, asbab un nuzul. This is one of the branches of the science of the Quran. What's asbab un nuzul in English? The reasons behind the revelation. You cannot say, I, I, I think this ayah was revealed for this reason. You cannot say these things. You have to understand why this ayah was revealed. In which context? What's the historical background? So I want to ask you here today, what is the historical background? How the concept of mentorship was evolved? So of course, it started by our very first mentor, very first teacher, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the very first mentor of the Ummah. He wasn't only teacher. Someone will go to the classroom, do his thing and leave. Of course not. He was, the, he was a mentor. That's why whenever people explained him, they explained him based on his knowledge or his character. His, his character, as sadiq al-Amin. Thank you. They, ex they described him based on his character, as sadiq al-Amin. And then the Sahaba came, the companions, and the companions are the best mentees in our history. Why? Because they didn't learn intellectually from peace be upon him only. They documented his knowledge, yes. They preserved his legacy, absolutely. But at the same time, they knew everything about his adab, his character, how he used to make wudu, how he used to talk to his servant, how he, how he used to deal with animals. And mentees do that. Students don't. Students will go, you finish your assignments, submit the assignments, mission accomplished. There is no connection between and the teacher. Matter of fact, you don't know even your teacher. But mentees, they must know their, their mentors. And they have to, like Al-Aliya, she used to ask her son, I want you to learn from his characters. And that's the, what the Sahaba did. They got inspired by the akhlaq and the morals and the characters of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then another generation came, the generation of the founders of the Madahib. Imam Abu Hanifa, we mentioned his name in the, in the khutbah today, born 80 Hijri and died 150 Hijri. He used to have two mentees, two very close mentees. Abu Hassan al-Shaybani and uh, Yaqub ibn Ibrahim, best known as Al-Qadi Abu Yusuf, Abu Yusuf the judge. The, in, in the books of fiqh, you will find Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu said that وَخَالَفَاهُ صَاحِبَاه His two ashab, his two mentees, they didn't agree with him. They didn't say, his students didn't accept this. وَخَالَفَاهُ صَاحِبَاه His closest mentees, Al-Shibani and, 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 and Al-Qadi Yusuf, they didn't agree with him. So the concept of companionship continued from the Prophet to the companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even to the time of the founders of the Madahib. And then started the second century. Elite, elite used to have what's so called Al Mu'addib. Teacher used to be only for the average people. So I want to ask you here. <laughs> Who is the most famous Mu'addib during that time? His name is Salih ibn Kaysan, better known as At-Tawus, Peacock. 
I, I really want you to write the, the, down the name. He was one of the most amazing mentors in our history. And he used to be the mentor of whom? Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, radiallahu anhu, the fifth Khalifa, one of the Umayyad's Khulafa. His father was the governor of Egypt, Abdul Aziz, and his uncle was the Khalifa. And Omar, he was a young man, and his father appointed Salih ibn Kaysan, the peacock, to be his mentor. And one time, Salih waited for his mentee at the masjid. And by the way, how many years the great Omar ibn Abdul Aziz became the Khalifa of the Ummah? And we always mention his name and his righteousness and his piety and his gener generosity and humility. How many years Omar ibn Abdul Aziz was the Khalifa? Two years. With the huge legacy that he left, only two years, 99 to 101. And I think the, most of the credit goes to his mentor, Salih ibn Kaysan, better known as Peacock. And they used to call him Peacock because his voice in reciting the Quran was phenomenal. So one time the mentor was waiting for the mentee at the masjid. Teachers do not do that, but mentors will. Mentors will tell their, their mentees, I will go to Salat al-Maghrib and I want you to come. Come and pray with me. So one time Omar didn't come. So he asked him, where were you? So he told him, uh, don't, don't blame me. That my, you know, the, the, the girl that she used to take care of my hair, she came late. So he told him, yeah, Omar, you missed Salat al-Fajr or Salat al-Maghrib because the one that takes care of your hair didn't come on time? Yes. You know what the mentor did? And Omar was the son of the governor of Egypt and the, the nephew of Khalifa al-Muslimin, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. You know what, what did he do? He sent a message to his father and he told him, my mentee, your son, did something horrible and I want to pull his ear. So he told him, do whatever you want. You know what did he do? He shaved his hair. Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, the fifth Khalifa, his mentor decided to shave his hair. Why? Because he came late. That's what mentors do. Did any, did any mentor shave your hair before? Don't answer this question. <laughs> and of course, Sufism, and I'm talking here about the real Sufism. I teach a class, uh, and I wrote a book about history called The Scholar and the King. I didn't publish the book yet. The Scholar and the King, with one of my intellectual partners, may Allah bless her sister, Sarah Siddiqui. Um, and and in, this, in this class, in this book, we pinpoint all the mentors behind our Khulafa and Salatin and, and Kings, from the Umayyads all the way until the Ottomans. Who was the spiritual figure behind all the Khulafa? Who trained them? Who shaped their identities? Who prepared them for, for, for you know, to, to be leaders and to be kings? And in this book, we mention that Sufism, don't look at, at the Sufism now and, you know, this kind of weird, weird activities and, and what they do. If you read about the real essence of, of Sufism, you will feel something different. I personally feel that Sufism preserved Islam during the Ottoman Empire. If you look at the spiritual figure behind the founder of, of the Ottoman Empire of man, was um, uh, a Sheikh Adib Ali, in Arabic, Adib Ali. Adib Ali, I personally feel he was the spiritual founder of the Ottoman Empire. If you look at his connection between his mentee of man, the founder of the whole Ottoman Empire, you will understand me very well. And even Muhammad al-Fatih, Muhammad the conqueror of Constantinople, his, ment his mentor was Sheikh Aq Shamsuddin. He was a Sufi Sheikh as well. So you have to start looking at Sufism from different perspective. And of course, the, our, our Sufi Sheikh, uh, Rumi ibn Arabi, Al-Ghazali, Abdul Qadr al-Jilani, they used to be great Sufi teachers and they used to have mentees. The last one is, is, very, is very controversial because I always feel that in this day and age, all our scholars should have mentees. 
you shouldn't, most of our scholars, and again, you know, protect all of them, some of our scholars, it's hard for them to resist this, resist this kind of celebrity you know, mentality. I want to go there. I want to have you know, thousands of people w waiting for me. I don't have time to work with people on one-on-one -on -one basis. That's why most of those scholar, scholars, they leave this world and no one preserves their knowledge. They must have a very close mentee who works with them, who preserves their legacy, who observes their akhlaq and character, and then they will be the best preserver of their knowledge. Why mentorship in Islam is very important. I, I really want to put here some, some reasons just for you to understand why this concept is really important and why we're here today to, to talk about um, uh, mentorship. I think one of the very, the very important and significant reasons why um, mentorship is important because it means that the mentee will preserve the knowledge of the mentor. And then the, the mentee will pass on the knowledge of the mentor to the next generation. And that's exactly what the Sahaba did with Rasulullah The first generation of mentees in Islam, the companions, they preserved everything he said. They per one time, even he was, he was joking, and one of his mentees, one of his students, Abdullah ibn Umar, told him, Ya Rasulullah, shall I write down your joke? So what did PSP upon him say? Did he, did, he, did he tell him, no, it was a joke, don't write it down. No, what did he say? You have to write everything I say. Why? Because everything I say, my jokes, my actions are part of the revelation. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى even, even your joke, Ya Rasulullah, even my joke, they are part of... You know, one of the, one of the examples here is whenever one of the, you know, one of the older women in the, in the community came and she told him, Ya Rasulullah, Sister, you know the story? She was a little bit on the older side. So Ya Rasulullah, please make dua for me to enter Jannah. So what did he say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No, I cannot make this dua for you because older women will never enter Jannah. And she started crying. So he told, calm down. I'm just joking with you. You will never enter Jannah while you're, you're old. You will enter Jannah while you are 33 years old. And now, fiqhi perspective, we know from this joke that we will enter Jannah, inshallah, in, in which age? 33. So this joke be became part of the, our jurisprudence. See what I'm saying? Transmission of knowledge is one of the reasons. What is the impact of the failure to transmit knowledge? And I put here a couple of, and I mentioned this in the khutbah today, these are all six scholars. How many madhahab, by the way? How many madhahab? They are very famous now. Four madhahab, right? By the way, we had almost 10 madhahib. Imam Sufyan, Imam Al-Awza'i, Al-Layth ibn Sa'ad, Ishaq ibn Rahawiya, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, Dawood al-Asfahani. We have 10 madhahib, not only four. But what happened to, to this madhahib? The mentees didn't preserve the knowledge of the mentors. So what happened after that? It's gone. Imam Abu, Abu, Abu Hanifa, he had two, two mentees, Shibani and the Qadi Yusuf. They preserved his knowledge. Who was the most brilliant knowledge for Imam Shafi'i, for Imam Malik? Was Imam Shafi'i. Who was the most brilliant knowledge, uh, students or mentee for Imam Shafi'i? Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Who was the most brilliant student and mentee for Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal? Imam al Bukhari and Imam Muslim and Ishaq ibn Rahawiya. The cycle of knowledge. If mentors, if scholars cannot find the right mentees around them, they will be in trouble. The ummah will be in trouble. Maybe the mentors will live a nice life, they travel, they are very famous, but the problem is it will be a huge loss. That 30, 40 years worth of knowledge will be gone. Why? Because they didn't invest 
in having the right mentees around them. Sister Rasai and I, we, we had this discussion last week. <laughs> I hope you're convinced now. Just <laughs> Okay. Spiritual guidance. Another reason why mentorship is really important is the concept of spiritual guidance. And I mentioned here uh, Salah ibn Kaysan and Umar, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Salah ibn Ayyubi and Ibn Asakir. Salah ibn Ayyubi, the great military leader. You have to understand who was behind Salah ibn Who prepared Salah ibn to stand against the crusaders? Uthman and Adib Ali, Edubali, Muhammad the Conqueror and Aqsham Siddin. Most of those mentors, they were the spiritual leaders behind, behind their mentees. They uplifted them spiritually. And they have this kind of spiritual connection. And that's where I started by, by saying feeling safe in their connection attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your mentor should be a role model. Who is, your, who is your child role model? Influencers? YouTubers? Those, we call them debaters. They have millions of fans, why? Because like, you know, they debate very well. And subhanAllah, if you look at the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to say, just da'al mira' walau kunta muhaqqan. Steer away from debate. Steer away from argument, even if you are right. So who, who, who are our role models? Those who are very famous, those who have, you know, network and, and fans and supporters and comments and likes and, and share. I don't think so. Who is the role model? I was talking to Brother Amr today, his very old friend. We grew up together. He lives five minutes away from here. Today, I, I went to his house and we spent some time in Loveless, him and his wife, they, they, they you know, honored us. So most of the time, I always talk about our mentors. We, we used to have common mentors and disagree or agree with them. They are the main reason where we stand today and why, what we do today because of our mentors. Because they are our role models. Allah is my witness. I was talking, I'm 47 now. I was talking to one of my mentors who was one of my mentors while I was like 19, 20 years? Like 27. I cannot forget about them. Whenever I have any problem in my life, the first thing I will do is just to call my mentor. Role models. Brother Muni, whenever it's time for prayer, inshallah. Personal development. They help you Identify strengths, overcome weaknesses, achieve your full potential in both religious and worldly pursuits. They give you sincere, sound, good, and long-term advice. Personal development is one of the, one of the uh, importance of mentorship. Community building. One of, one of the, the hadith that our mentors used to tell us, and whenever I, get, I, I got older, I figured out this, this hadith is a little bit of weak hadith. And I have, with the sake of honesty, I have to, to, sh to, to share this. Um, hadith Huzaifa ibn al-Yaman, Imam al-Hakim and Imam al-Tabarani uh, accepted this hadith, but Imam al-Albani didn't accept it. Man lam yahtam bi amri muslimina falaysa minhum. He who does not pay attention to the affairs of Muslims, he doesn't belong to them. I grew up on this hadith. That's why the moment we know that there is a problem in Palestine, we will run to the street. There's a problem in Chechnya, Kosovo, Bosnia. We used to be have this to have this connection between us and Muslims. It doesn't matter. We know them. We don't know them. This is our community. This is our people. So mentors always help us to be connected to the bigger ummah, to the bigger community. Preservation, and let me stop by this before Salatul Maghrib. Preservation of tradition. One of my professors, one of my teachers, Dr. Zirina, um, she's a professor at Yale, and I took one of the classes with her, and we studied his book, her book, Islam is a Foreign Country. Amazing book. And in my, in my final project, I tried to, to, to prove that mentorship 
is the key to preserve Islamic identity, to preserve Islamic legacy. And mentors help our children maintain cultural identity and heritage while adapting to the contemporary challenges. This is a great book. If you have time to read, this will teach you how mentors can help preserving the identity. Let's stop for uh, prayer, Brother Muni, inshallah. We will pray outside. Bismillah. Zakrat, inshallah, we're going to resume after Salat al Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah, an another important uh, piece here, why mentorship is critical, uh, because it, it helps mentees to serve others. Why? Because they receive the service from whom? From their mentors. So it really helps them. Okay, I, I received all this service from my mentor. For years, he has been helping me. He has, uh, he has been uplifting me. I think now it's time for me to do the same without seeking any monetary benefit. Um, and I think one of the most important pieces that I want to end with, just to, to, to give some time for, for, for your questions and your comments and feedback, what are the characteristics of the best mentor? So for the sake of argument, you know, I did a good job uh, talking about the historical background of mentorship, and I told you why mentorship is really important, and the guys are sold now. Okay, I think the next point, what are the characteristics, the attributes of mentors? So now you can ask yourself, is this the right mentor for me or not? And, and this is a really important piece here because are we talking about influencers and bloggers with hundreds of thousands of fans and followers, Zainab? If this, are these the, the right mentors that we're looking for? I don't think so. Are we talking about here about very eloquent speakers? That they come, they say great things, and then you spend like 10 years without seeing them again? These are, they are teachers. We have to learn from them, by the way. We have to grasp good ideas from them. And of, definitely, you will learn something from them. But they are not mentors. You need someone who is very accessible to you. And one of the brothers, may Allah bless him, he just nailed it. After Salat al-Maghrib, he told me, I have been trying to find a mentor and I couldn't. There are many speakers and scholars and they come here and other masajid and they speak great things. They say great things. But I need a mentor. I don't need a speaker that I will listen to him for 40 minutes and after that, barely I will see him again or her again. I need mentors and I couldn't find any mentors. Are we talking about famous scholars, celebrities with office managers that whenever you try to, to find them, it's just you have to send you know message or email to the office manager and the office manager will send you to the, the <laughs> another office manager. They are not accessible. Very hard to catch them. Very hard even to find them. Very hard to communicate with them directly. Are we talking about controversial speakers who use foul language and profanity? I don't think this is not <laughs> the right mentors. Are we talking about debaters who proudly say that they can smash people in no time? Those are no mentors. Those are no mentors. These people, you meet them, you cross paths with, with them, that's it. They are not your mentors. What are the characteristics of mentors? What are the expectations from mentors? And you know, whenever, if, if, if let me give you this very simple example. If you're uh, an owner of, of, of a company, before you hire people, you have to ask yourself, what is the scope of work? Do I really need people to do what? So you cannot say, I need people. People to do what? So before you, you say, I need mentors, you have to, to ask yourself, what are my expectations from the mentor? And based on the expectations, now you can break it down and you can say, now these are the characteristics of the mentors. So what are the expectations? We live in a time that we have mental, in our children and even adults, in, 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 this, in this matter, they have mental illness, loneliness, Materialistic life, lack of spirituality, sexual deviation, atheism, collapse of the public school system, the broken moral system, lack of good company, Islamophobia, addiction, and so on and so forth. We need mentors who can help us with these things. Not someone who will add to these things. So this is the scope. These are the expectations. 
What are the characteristics? We need someone who have or who has the divine knowledge. And this is a little bit controversial because if you ask me, do, do, we, do, do we need a mentor that he or she, they have um, like solid Islamic knowledge or someone who just, you know, he's, he's, he's very cool, he's very cheerful, oh, my mentor is so funny. We need someone who has solid Islamic knowledge. You know what, as, as someone who grew up in, in Saudi and, and, you know, got to, to go to school there and in Egypt, there are a hadith that we grew up knowing that these hadith are authentic. I'll give you one of them. Seek knowledge even if you are in China. We used to hear this one. By the way, this is extremely fabricated hadith. We, all, we grew up knowing this hadith. It's not a hadith in the first place. And then another hadith. Ramadan, the first 10 days are rahmah, and the, 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 the other 10 days are maghfira. It's not a hadith. It's extremely weak. We grew up knowing that this hadith is very authentic. It's not. Another one, Sawtul Mar'a Awra. The voice of Mar'a, of woman, is, is, is Awra. It's not a hadith. And we grew up knowing, oh, you know, you cannot, you don't allow your, your daughter to raise her voice. Why? Because Sawtul Mar'a, it is not Awra. There is no hadith that says that the voice of woman is Awra. Some, another hadith that is very common in our culture uh, that you have as a spouse, as, as, as a male, you have to consult with your wife and whenever your wife tells you, you have to do the opposite. And what does the hadith, it's, it's not hadith, shawiruhunna wa khalifuhunna. We grew up in our culture that this is a hadith, that you have to consult with your wife and because she is so emotional and irrational, if she tells you go right, it means that you have to take left. Shawiruhunna, consult with them and then do the opposite. And when I ask people, why would you do that? Oh, because the Prophet said that. He didn't. That's why you need a mentor who can differentiate between the authentic hadith and the weak hadith. So I think the answer is yes. You need a mentor. Well, I'm talking to the brother that someone who is solid in his Islamic and divine knowledge. How to do this? By sponsoring students of mine. That was my khutbah today. If you don't have enough scholars and enough teachers, you have to understand, what is the problem? Why, why, why one of the brothers, he couldn't find mentors? Why? Because we have very few scholars. We have very few teachers. Maybe this is our communal obligation to have more by sponsoring more. One of the characteristics here is someone who has the best adab. Someone who hates fame. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Allah Rahamu, um, born 164 and died 241 Hijri. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the, the founder of the, of the Hanbali Madhab, one time his students told him, Ya Imam, Abshir, I want to give you the glad tiding. We have almost 50,000 people came to your masjid in Baghdad to listen to your class. Imagine the number. He died 241 Hijri. 50,000 students coming to learn from him. What did Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal do? He left the masjid. He left. So everyone was waiting for him. Where did he go? He went home. So one of his very close mentees told him, Ya Imam, why did you leave the masjid? Everyone was waiting for you. So he said, Bulitu bi shuhra. My biggest affliction in this life is shuhra, that I became like a celebrity. The people, oh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal in this masjid, run after him. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal here, lawadattu, wallahi lawadattu, I wish I live in Mecca, in the valley around al Kaaba. no one knows me. We need these mentors. Someone who doesn't acknowledge fame. Someone who is very accessible. Someone who has the best adab. One of the great hadith that really, peace be upon him, said that those 
that Allah Azza wa Jal will protect them from the hellfire, those who are very accessible to people, those who have very tender and soft nature. And these are the mentors that we need. Someone that you always need him or her, you find them. أَلَا أُخْبِرُكُمْ بِمَنْ تَحْرُمُ عَلَيْهِ النَّارِ Shouldn't I tell you with those that nar will never touch them? So the Sahaba waited for peace be upon him to say something amazing about the ibadah. He said, no, it's not about this. It's the scholar who is always accessible to his people. He's always accessible to his students and mentees. Someone who doesn't put a layer of management and emails. It's just very hard to find them. Those accessible teachers and mentors, it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you find one of them, stick to them. Spiritual insight. The one who reminds you while they are talking, even in their silence. You go and you are in the presence of your mentor, you feel this spiritual connection. He doesn't have to say anything. Just being in the company of your mentor, you feel, you know, we call it the closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The remembrance of Allah. His presence in your life, while he's, he's communicating with you every day or not, while he's sending you a message or not, while he's sending you email or not, while he's calling you or not, their presence in, in your life bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Spiritual insight. One of the characteristics of the mentors. Wisdom and discernment. I'll, I'll give you a, an example here. Muhammad al-Fatih. Fatih al Constantiniyah, The conqueror of Constantinople. His, his teacher, his mentor was Sheikh Aqsham Siddin. Sheikh Aqsham Siddin was one of the great Sufi scholars. I always called Sheikh Aqsham Siddin as a Turkish scholar. I used to, to call him the spiritual conqueror of Constantinople. Muhammad al fatih of course, the physical one, he was the military leader, but Aqsham Siddin as the mentor, he was the spiritual conqueror. One time, Muhammad al fatih the, the, the great Ottoman uh, sultan, he asked his, his mentor, would you allow me to attend your Sufi halqa. Look at the wisdom of the mentor. He told him, no, you shouldn't attend my Sufi halqa. He told him, I am Khalifa al-Muslimin. I am the Ottoman emperor now. Why would you prevent me? You're my teacher. You have to allow me to attend your Sufi halqa. He told him, Wallahi ya Muhammad. He never called him Sultan. Look at the mentor. He will never play this fame game with the menti. It doesn't matter your mentee became, you know, very famous or not. He never called him Sultan. He used to call him, Ya Muhammad. Ya Muhammad. Ya Muhammad. He told him, Ya Muhammad, if you attend my Sufi halqa, you will never become the, the Sultan again. You, you're going to be little kingdomship. You're going to be little palaces. You're going to be little power. And we, I, we need you as an ummah to be Muhammad al-Fatih. I don't want you to be Sufi murid. I have a lot of murids. I have a lot of mentees. But you, the moment you attend one of my halqa, you will never become Muhammad al-Fatih again. You will never leave my Sufi halqa. And this ummah needs you. Wisdom and discernment. Patience and empathy. It's very hard to change people, says Husay, right? It's very hard. And it takes a lot of patience. Our son, who is five years old, he needs a lot of patience to, to change him, to change his behavior. And this is something that mentors should have. You need a mentor who has all this kind of empathy and patience. Dr. Tarq Swidan, one of the Kuwaiti uh, um, scholars, he has a lot of articles and videos about what's so called the management of change. And I think most of them are being even translated into English. And he gave Dr. Tariq in his lectures the prescription for change. And every mentor has to be extremely patient with his mentees. You know that drip irrigation system? Just very slowly, surely, steadily. Guidance and support. What did I put here at, at, the, at, at the end? What's this word? What, what does that mean? 
the car, thank you. I know this like two, three days ago. My daughter was in, in Arizona. She told me, Dad, could you believe this? Uh, I, I asked for a car, and it, the car came without a driver. So, what do you mean? Yeah, it's just a new service, a new company now. I think it was Google. They started this software, and the car will come to you without a driver. So that's so scary. And then the car will take you from point A to point Z without doing anything. Why I'm sharing this? Because we need someone who can learn and has the, 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 the passion to learn and always feel that I have to... You know, one of the brothers was telling us Salat al-Maghrib, the more I learn about Islam, the more I know that I, I don't know about Islam. Imam al-Shafi'i, uh, rahimahullah, said, Al-alimu, لا يزيده علمه إلا علما بجهله العالم لا يزيده علمه إلا علما بجهله The more the scholar learns the more he knows about his ignorance because you're just like small drop in an ocean of knowledge the divine knowledge سبحانه وتعالى Communication skills is really important and this is where I put this hadith Shall I not tell you whom the hellfire is forbidden to touch? It's forbidden to touch a man who is always accessible, having a polite and tender nature. We need, we need these mentors. You, you, you need them, you find them. They communicate. They, they, they reply. They respond to you. If there is a mentor that doesn't reply to you, he's not, he's, he might be a speaker, he might be a professor, but he's not a mentor. Commitment to continuous learning. And even I added here, every time I speak to Ustaz Hussai, she will, she will always give me something new. Last time she, she gave me this book, and I have even, I was reading the book these days. Amazing book. Calling of the American Mind. And then a couple of days ago, she sent me this article, Foundations of Spiritual Path. We need those mentors that they are surrounded with scholars. He's not someone who feels that I know everything. I don't need any, any teachers around me. I don't need any mentors. Oh, I finished school long time ago. I have been recycling knowledge since then. We don't need these mentors. We need humble and sincere mentors who are always surrounded with mentors, who are always surrounded with teachers. Community engagement. This is one of the characteristics of mentors. Someone who's always with the community, helping and donating, shoulder to shoulder, carrying stuff. We need these mentors. We need someone who believes in a community, believes in, in, in donation, believes in, in, in participation. Adherence to sunnah and avoidance of innovation. We need someone who will help our mentees, our children, to steer away from bid'ah not to be another source of confusion. That's why I added here a mentor who always avoids this gray area. Successful in their professional careers. And I want to end with this. Because it's a little bit controversial. Do we really need a mentor who is well off? And I did research in this. Do we need a, men a mentor who is su successful in his business? Someone who is really well off and he has good experience, good knowledge, entrepreneur, very successful in what they do? I think the answer is yes. And I give here an example that I will conclude with, and so we can, so I and I, we can take some questions. One of the Sahaba, that I really want to end with his story, He's very famous. I think everyone knows him. His name is Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Mus'ab ibn Umayr. And I really want you, if there is one thing, I want you to, to, to take from me today the story of Mus'ab ibn Umayr. And I call Mus'ab ibn Umayr the one who invaded Medina. Peace be upon him, went to Medina, where Medina was waiting for him. So who paved Medina for peace be upon him? This Sahabi, this mentor, 
Musab ibn Umair. And this is his story. Musab was one of the most rich people in Mecca. When Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted to send someone as a mentor to connect the hearts of the disbelievers in Medina, he sent to them an extremely well-off mentor. Someone who was very successful. In, in, uh, in, in the hadith, uh, I have not seen a person more blessed by Allah's bounty than Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Even I want to ask you, who was the closest person to peace be upon him? The one who immediately believed in his message. What's his name? Abu Bakr Siddiq. Abu Bakr was a well-off person or not? He was very well-off. And how about those that Abu Bakr invited them to become Muslims? And Mubashiruna bil Jannah. Those who received the glad tiding to, to enter Islam, I'm sorry, to enter Jannah without questioning their deeds. 90% of, of the ten, they were very successful businessmen. So you have Islam doesn't stand against success. Islam didn't stand against those who have the means. But we, we want those who use the means the right way. We really need someone like Musab. We need someone who will impress our children. Oh, look at my mentor. He is Hafiz. He has strong foundations in the deen. He's a teacher of Islam. But at the same time, he's a balanced person. He's very successful. He's well off. He, he knows cars. He knows businesses. He knows stock market. I'm not talking about like, you know, you know, some, it, it's mission, mission impossible. We have people around, around, like this around us, but we have to find them. We have to inspire them. We have to, to motivate them and bring them closer to the masajid. Not everyone is very religious. We have to bring them. Some of them, they need sponsorship. And, and I mentioned this in the khutbah, that I teach with one of the uh, graduate school in Chicago, and I have flyers here with me, 80% of our students, we sponsor them. Why? Because it's an accredited school. And it's, we offer only master and PhD. Master in, in, in uh, I'm sorry, do doctorate in, 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 in le Islamic leadership. And master in Islamic, leader, in Islamic leadership, Islamic theology, Islamic studies, and Islamic chaplaincy. All the programs are accredited. But guess what? To finish a master in Islamic studies, you know how much it's going to cost you in two years? Because it's a closed program. How much? 50 to 60,000. Chaplaincy is the most expensive one. 50 to 60,000 in two years. How many people can, can pay this amount of money? 80% of our students, we sponsor them. That's why this is the key. We have as an ummah, before you spend the money right and left and find poor and needy, you have to ask you know, Sheikh Abu Shaq al-Hawaini, and I mentioned this in the khutbah, he said, and this is his fatwa, may Allah grant him long life, he's still alive, he said, if two people come to you asking for donation, ask yourself, which one of them is more beneficial to the ummah? If some one of them just needs money to eat, and the other one needs money to learn and spread knowledge, you have to support them. He said that 90% of the students of knowledge in Egypt, they struggle with poverty. Why? Because they don't have the means. Uh, uh, Musa ibn Umayr, he was 14 years younger than Prophet Muhammad So you need someone who is not the age of your dad. Little bit younger. Not confrontational. Muslims in Medina, they want to peace be upon him during the, 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 the pledge of, of Aqaba, the first pledge. And they told Ya Rasulullah, we need a mentor to come with us to Medina. We're only 12. We need a mentor, we need Qari'. We need a scholar to come with us to Medina in one year. This mentor, Mus'ab ibn Umayr, he returned to peace be upon him next year. How many? Almost 75. He brought more than 60 new souls to Islam. He wasn't a confrontational person. He was very successful. He used to be, be Hafiz al-Quran. He had religious presence. And that's why I called him the spiritual conqueror of Medina. 
How did he spread Islam? Communication skills. He used to knock at every door in Medina. I am Musab ibn Umair. I used to live in Mecca. I'm here as a mentor. Would, do you have some time to listen to me? I am the ambassador of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I have a message for you. He used to knock at every door. So we need mentors that they have this command, charisma, the pride to go and knock at every door and spread the message without any shame. He, had, he was a very open-minded person. Why? Because he used to travel. We need mentors like this. Someone who loves to travel. He has a lot of ideas. He, he can generate thoughts. Yeah, I went to this place and I have memories there. Is it impossible to find mentors like this? I think this is my question to you. Is it impossible to find mentors like this? You know why? Sometimes we, we face troubles, find mentors like this, because we are not trying to build them. You know, from where should we start with our children? If you cannot find mentor for yourself, how about you prepare your children to be mentors for the future? And to be mentors for future mentees. And if, if this life didn't help you to find the right mentors, how about you prepare your children to be the right mentors, inshallah, for the best mentees in the future? I, I want to stop here and get a couple of questions, inshallah. And please, I, I, you know, our Sister Hussain is here, so I really, I really want you to take advantage of, of her presence, uh, of her knowledge. Uh, so please, Sister Hussain, you know, keep the microphone with you for now. So please direct all your questions to no, her. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so I'll walk around the mic, inshallah. We, if you want to come sit up here on the other side. And did you, did I'm you fine. want to rest? I'm fine. Okay. When you mentioned the aura of a woman that it's not part of her voice, then why do people like so many cultural, but also some scholars say like singing and reciting Quran and like purifying your voice is not allowed? I don't know. Because Zainab, um, people are very culturally oriented. Meaning, they heard this long time ago, Sawt al Aura. The problem is, no one decided to dig deeper to ensure the authenticity of the hadith, to verify the authenticity of the hadith. They, they will find very easily that it's not even hadith. And that's the problem, that people, they, sometimes they believe in culture. You know, I'll give you an example. In our culture, and I heard this myself, two brothers and they have one sister, and the dad passed away. So the husband of, of the, the sister, their sister, he came asking for her inheritance. You know, what did the brothers tell him? In our family, we don't give inheritance to whom? To women. So he told them, do you have an ayah or hadith? Oh, we don't know, but our teachers told us that we cannot give money to it to so my point to you here is how to build our knowledge on sound foundations. The only way is to learn. We cannot just surrender our minds to culture. Oh, someone said that. Who, who said that? I don't take my knowledge from you. I take my knowledge from Quran and Sunnah and the Ajma of the Sahaba. That's why the more, that's why I call it Al-Ummiyya al diniyya um, Ignorance that comes with religion. People sometimes, they pretend that they are religious, but they are ignorant. Why? Because they never had teachers. They never had an academic way of learning Islam. So 100% this hadith is fabricated. Women, has, women have all the rights to recite the Quran. Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha used to be one of the great teachers of the ummah. We learned so many things from her. She used to be one of the fundamental f characters in our ummah as one of the scholars. We learned so many things about peace be upon him from whom? From Sayyidah Aisha. If her voice is Aura, how did we learn from her? More questions? Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you. I started the khutbah today by a statement of one of the great tabi'in. His name is Sufyan al-Thawri. Died 161 Hijri. And Sufyan al-Thawri, I mentioned his name on the slides as one of the founder of the madhahib that sadly the whole madhahib is gone. So Sufyan al-Thawri said, لا أعلم من العبادة شيئا أفضل من أن يعلم الناس العلم. There is no such act of worship that is more rewarding, that is more beneficial, that is more fulfilling than teaching people beneficial knowledge. So the scholars are in agreement that sponsoring students, of course, they had some conditions. And I, I, I don't want to go that far, but they have three conditions. Number one is um, for th this sponsorship to be Sadaqa Jariyab, they have three conditions. I hope I remember all of them. Number one, his parents or her parents cannot afford. Now your Sadaqa will make the change. Number two, he or she, this potential student, they do not expect any inheritance. Now your sadaqa will be sadaqa jariyah. The third reason is um, that this student is, a, we call it in Arabic, a tilmiz and najib. Najib is smart student. You cannot just give the money to someone who doesn't even want to go to school. So these three conditions, if these three boxes, if you check out all of them, then the ulama are in agreement that your sadaqah will be sadaqah jari. And you know what, sister? And, and this is the problem. Sometimes <clears throat> someone would say, I cannot be a scholar anymore, khalas. Um, I have students, wallahi, they are 55 and 60 years old. And they start. They start learning now. It's never too late to, to learn, by the way. However, sometimes if you feel that because of so many other you know, life reasons, you cannot be a scholar, sponsor someone. And by sponsoring someone, this is Sadaqa Jariya for you and for your family. More questions? I'm loud. It's okay. Assalamu alaikum. So uh, I appreciate all the criteria you put for uh, the mentors. But at the same time, for mentees sometimes, um, how do we know who do we put trust in? As the sister said, and as you mentioned m multiple times, we we learned a lot of stuff that it wasn't real, right? Like it wasn't hadith, but right. you know, we just lived as it was. So, uh, do you think there should be a criteria like they have to memorize the Quran, they have to have some kind of degree, so they have to have a reputation, and how do we protect ourselves from dismissing good scholars because we disagree with something that they said, right? You know, like if if a scholar that you know all your life and suddenly told you that. Uh, some country has the right to defend itself. For example, right? <laughs> so, so, Jazakallah. So basically, your first question is how to pinpoint the, the right mentees. I think one of the biggest problems that we, we have now is... Um, I'm sorry, the right mentors, not mentees. As a mentees, how do we select our mentors? Right. So first and foremost, you have to go through the, the criteria, the characteristics of the mentors. And ma matter of fact, I don't think we should even ignore even once one of them. You have to ensure that all these cri criteria and all the characteristics are checked out. The problem, Brother Ali, here is, and I think we always face this, we couldn't find mentors. It's very hard to find mentors. Why? Because most of the scholars, they are super busy teaching classes. And, you know, because we have very, very little scholars, right? So it's, it's hard for us to say, you know, can you take me as, 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 as mentee? Some, most of them, even you cannot reach them. Maybe you, you can find them after khutbah. Can you take me? Oh, yeah, take my number and, you know, we'll communicate. I think it will end there. One of the biggest problem here is, we do not have enough scholars. We do not have enough mentors. Matter of fact, just to add to another layer of complexity, 
most of those scholars, they don't see themselves as mentors. They look at themselves as, you know, I, I am a speaker. Yeah, I don't have time for all of this. I cannot work with, with anyone one-on-one. -on -one. That's why we always have a problem. Yes, you can go, you can teach at Yale, you can teach at Stanford, you can go to Berkeley, absolutely. But at the end of the day, you have to find, and I'm, I'm talking about here, I'm focusing on the quality, not the quantity. I believe that mentors and scholars should be very selective. Why? Because they don't have all the time. You cannot spend two years with Sharif and then, oh yeah, he's, he's, he's not serious. You have to be very selective in finding the right mentees. But at the same time, you shouldn't continue the cycle of teaching without having at least one or two mentees. They are always around you, reading and writing. Imam Malik explaining his relationship with, with his murabbi, with his mentor, al rabia He used to say, Imam Malik, Wallahi, I used to arrive the house of my mentor. I used to pray Salat al-Fajr with him. And what time he used to leave his house? After Salat al-Asha. That's, that's why he became Imam Malik. Right? So just back to your question, I think we have, or, or scholars, they should believe in mentorship. I, 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 could, I, I don't see this. Very rare to find one of the scholars, if you ask him, like, immediately, do you have a mentee? 90% of them, no, sadly, I don't have any mentees. I, I don't have time for mentees. So my advice to them, just select one or two. Focus with them. Uh, open your door for them. Allow them to be your partners in intellectual projects. And of course, you know, the, the concept of how to find them, you have to go through the characteristics. And you cannot ignore one of them. You have to check all the boxes. Does that answer your question? How, how when, when you disagree with a, a mentor or a scholar on something that they're saying. Like what? I gave you an example, like somebody you know, and then they side with the oppressor. Suddenly you feel yourself, like you don't want to believe anything else that they said, even though that they contributed. Of course. You know, back to Imam Malik again. Imam Malik used to be criticized that he was, he used to be very soft with the muluk. And I don't agree with this. However, Imam Malik himself used to say, I want to keep this connection with muluk. Because if, if I decided to steer away from them, who will be around muluk? Bad scholars. So I want to be around them. Maybe, you know, this connection does not make everyone happy, but I want to be around them. Maybe they will not listen to me 100%, but at least my presence is better than my absence. So there are many scholars, they disagree with Imam Malik. However, he never accepted money from anyone. Well, one of the, 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 the nice ideas about, about Imam Malik, the, the Maliki brothers from North Africa, whenever you go and see them praying, how they pray? They pray like this. Why? Because Imam Malik used to pray without raising his hand like this. Sheikh Abu Saq al-Hawani, he taught us this. He said that Imam Malik, that was not part of his fiqh. One of the, one of the Abbasid Khulafa, he tortured him and they dislocated his shoulder. That's why he cannot pray like this. And he used to pray like this. And the brothers from North Africa, they took this as part of his fiqh. You see what I'm saying? So there are many people that this disagreed with him. And I think it's okay sometimes to disagree with your, with your mentor. It's impossible to agree with, with them, you know, in everything. But at the same time, as long as, you know, there will always be controversy. There will always be differences. No way that everything that the mentor would say, the, the mentee will accept. But at the end of the day, as long as these differences are, are away from the main foundations and principles, I think we, you should continue. But if you feel that there's someone who stands with the oppressors, who receives money from them, who speaks on their behalf, I don't think this is the right mentor. Do you have one, one, of, those, one of those mentors around you? Back home, 
Okay. <laughs> so Brother Ali is from Syria. Any, any more questions? Huh? Half Palestinian, half Syrian, right? <laughs> any more questions, sisters? Sister so, so I wanna, wanna end with something. Jazakum Allah khairan. If you permit me, I'll sit, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Tasleem al kathira. Jazakum Allah khairan, Imam Sharif. MashaAllah, you know, when I think of you, when I think of the work that you've inspired at Tarbiyah Institute, the ayah from Surah At-Tawbah comes to mind. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ The believing men and the believing women are allies of one another. Because, mashallah, what you've created in your institute and what you do in your work and the way that you, mashallah, share this knowledge. I mean, th this is, I hope we all appreciate years of research that he has presenting to us. Uh, five years, was it Imam Shadi? Five years of research on this very important topic that is so critical in today's postmodern age, in the age where truth is under attack, in the age where our children are being literally uh, captured by by all of the things that you mentioned, from atheism to you know a lot of these ideologies that are being pushed on them, movements that they're being pushed on into. So, what you're doing is really, I think, giving us a lot of um, you know. Uh, something to think about critically that you know we're, we're trying to f fix the, the the problems in our uh, in our community and this is something that within every masjid we can do if we really start from ground zero and understand the weight and importance of inspiring our youth and and uh, you know as you mentioned starting with our children because for many of us you know we're um, life in in the West is, is is difficult you know we have a lot of responsibilities we're working we have families to raise we have uh, uh, you know parents to take care of there's people are very spread thin but but children can be uh, inspired and we can do I think a lot with everything you've presented here in terms of putting together programs and I, I, I feel like mashallah if you haven't been to Tarbiya Institute I remember when I went um, I think it was a year two years ago perhaps uh, when you had the graduation for the Nizami order that was probably one of the most like uh, inspiring things I've ever seen because you know you have I mean I've been, I've been to many masajid but mashallah to see so many youth um, up front and center you know I think it was over over 100 graduates you had over 100 graduates I was amazed like how how did you get a hundred youth to come mashallah and these are you know students or, or you know teenagers who go to the public schools who maybe go to islamic school maybe they're homeschooled they're a far a wide range but they were there proud and you had spent so much time training them how to give khutbas for the brothers how to lead how to you know do this dawah the uh, amount of effort you've put into putting your research and your knowledge and your wisdom in you know in action I saw I saw the effect of that, and that was honestly one of the most beautiful things I've seen. And I pray to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that we can, you know, somehow inspire um, all of our communities to really look to the precedent you've sent, to the example you've sent, and all of this work that you've put together to say that we can do this if we're thoughtful and we just and then the fact that you're br taking it all the way back to also the you know the origins of our uh, beautiful tradition and, and the prophetic model and the model of the sahaba is is so beautiful too because it's not this isn't we're not reinventing the wheel we're actually just doing what we should have never let go of in the first place which is the sunnah of our beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam who always uh, saw the best in people who really tried to uh, you know, look at every single individual with potential and and bring that out in them. And I think we've just we've we've gone so far from that. So Jazakumullah Khairan for Wallahi all that you've that you're doing and, and uh, I, I don't have anything further to add. Just Jazakumullah Khairan. Very, very appreciative to you. Thank you. Always great uh, having Suza Husai. Uh Suza Husai and I we, we partnered in a couple of projects and a couple of uh, events during the last couple of years and um, I, I always find comfort and ease in, in her presence uh, she's very soft-spoken um, she's she's very humble she's very accessible and that's exactly the mentors that we need 
may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you in, in, in sincerity of Sayyidina Sayyidina and in humility and keep you as a beacon of light and torch, torch of light and instrument of, of healing and catalyst for good in, in the community and for the community of Allahumma Amin I want to end by this. I think you have to ask yourself, can you be the right mentor for your children? And I, I really wanted someone to ask this question. And again, I, tr I try not to say I think and I believe, based on the research, you cannot be the right mentor for your children. I know sometimes it's hard to say these things, but you can't. Why? They know too much. Huh? You will. <laughs> you know too much. And you're, you, you, have a, you carry a different title. You're the dad. You're the mom. Your children will always look at you as a dad. Mom, you will never change this. And Brother Amr and I were talking today that we owe everything, Wallah al Azim, I owe everything to my, to my teachers. One of them, uh, Dr. Shaib, he is a professor at Al Azhar University. Now he teaches at Bahrain University. I cannot spend one week without calling him and talking. And he teaches me, you know, we have like a weekly class, class with him. And the amount, he's close to 70 years old. He never had a car. He never had a car. He used to squeeze his old body and going to the subway just to, to move from his house to Al-Azhar University. That's the mentors that we need. Allah is my witness. I was so busy during the last couple of weeks and he was busy, you know, the, the beginning of the year. And then all of a sudden he sent me a message. Ya walad, when we're going to restart, he, the teacher, the mentor, is reminding them in tea, where are we going to start? And then I told him, Fadiltak, whenever you're ready. So he told me, this are the, 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 my timing, and I'm flexible. And he's not flexible. He has a lot of stuff to do. With my age, I cannot live without a mentor. And I, I want to ask you these two questions. You cannot be the mentor of your children, and you have to accept this reality. So find a mentor. My oldest daughter, she was mentored by great sisters in, in our community. Ahmed, he couldn't join us today. Sandra, she has a mentor, one of my students. She's 20 years old. She is Sandra's mentor. And she has to check on her. She has to share things with her. She is her mentor. And I want my daughter to grow up having a mentor in her life. Someone, if she hesitates to share something with mom or dad, she will go immediately to whom? To her mentor. And she knows that her mentor is her dad's student. So at least she ensures this, you know, constant connection with Dean. So the, fir the first one, find a mentor for your children. Number two, do you have mentor yourself? And maybe this is the problem, says Hosea, that we have to bring to the community. Why we don't have... Maybe it's, it's hard to have like one-on-one. -on -one. Why not to have like ten-on-one? On -on Until, so we, we have to start somewhere. We need a mentor who would accept the reality that I have to generate mentors for the future. I have to accept mentees. You know, one thing that I do with my, with my mentees, and we have a couple here, and I will conclude with this. The moment they we, we, the, the join my one-on-one -on -one, uh, program. And I have, alhamdulillah, a couple of them, like almost 10. You ask me, w from where did you bring the time? It's Allah's barakah. From where did we get the money? It's Allah's barakah. This is the sadaqah of, of, of the time. Wallah al-azim, I have no idea how Allah Azza wa puts this magic together. So whenever th we, we join this program, I tell them, you have to work with me shoulder to shoulder. I have a couple of projects. You will never, I don't have time to spend like five years with you. You will always, you know, receive knowledge when you will be able to pay back for this knowledge. I will be 60 years old. So from day one, you learn and you start teaching. And by teaching, of course, I cannot ask them to teach, but they have to put materials together. So whenever they learn from me, they have to put this information on like a slideshow. They have to put it together. So whenever we finish one book, it's, this knowledge is only not for, for them. It can be populated. It can be distributed. 
So this is the assignment that I give to every mentee that works with me. You have to be ready that in one year, whenever we finish this book, I want to take from you a ready materials that we can teach classes based on these materials. So I think this is something, Brother Omar as well, I want to, to bring this up because, you know, I received this question twice today. I've been trying to find mentors, but I couldn't. Most of the scholars, they are very few and they are not very accessible. They are super busy. If I go to them and ask, can you be my mentor? They might laugh at me. Oh, man, I don't have time for this. So I think this is something which can bring, inshallah, to the scholars and the leaders in this community. And I want, inshallah, to... To end with a dua. Jazakumullah khair for hosting me today and hosting my family. May Allah Azza wa always keep this place under His supreme protection. Ya Allah, we raise our hands to you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We, uh, we call upon you and we praise you. Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Malik, Ya Quddus, Ya Salam, Ya Mu'minu, Ya Muhaymin, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask you to send our love to our Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, send our love and our praise to him. Ya Allah, tell our Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that 1,500 years after he, he left this world, thousands of miles away from Mecca, we're still here in California praising him and remembering him because we owe him everything, Ya Rabbil Alameen. As the first mentor, the one who set the right akhlaq and the standards of akhlaq for the ummah, he walked the talk and he led by example, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He inspired us by his, by his akhlaq. He inspired us by his characters. He inspired us by his honesty and truthfulness and sincerity. Allah, we ask you, as our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inspired us and motivated us in dunya, Allah, we ask you to bring us closer to him in, in your Jannah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allah, don't deprive us of the company of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah, allow us to remain steadfast on the path that he paved for us. Allah, allow us to, to remain close to his sunnah, close to his akhlaq, close to his traditions, close to his legacy, ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask you, when we leave this world, ya Rabbi, we ask you to allow knowledge to be the legacy that we will pass on to our children and grandchildren. Ya Allah, allow knowledge, allow divine knowledge and beneficial knowledge to be the legacy that we will leave behind so the Ummah can benefit from this knowledge until the Day of Judgment. Ya Allah, we ask you to put Barak in our time, to put Barak in our efforts, to put Barak in our teachings. Ya Allah, we ask you to put Barak in our children. Ya Allah, they, we raise them in a crazy time with the shayateen of ins and jinn, they chase them and they, they surround them. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect them and keep all of them under your supreme protection. Ya Allah, enable us to come, out, to, come, to come up with a system that will be a shield, that will protect our children from any evil in this dunya. Ya Allah, use us and utilize our humble resources and limited resources, Ya Rabb, to bring some goodness and to bring some kindness and to to bring some wisdom and to bring some safety to this to this ummah, Ya Rabb. Ya Allah, with all the madness that we, we, we see, we have been seeing in Palestine, and even our brothers and sisters in, 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 in UK, they are under attack. Ya Allah, we ask you to bring us closer to you and to grant us guidance and to keep all the places of worship, Ya, Allah, ya, ya Rabbil Alameen, under your supreme protection. Ya Allah, keep all the places of worship under your supreme protection. Ya Allah, we ask you to grant our leaders the right mindset to solve the problem of this Ummah. Ya Allah, motivate them and inspire them. Ya Allah, give them the right, the right mindset. Ya Allah, give them the right options. Give them the right solutions. Ya Allah, give the, them the right answers, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask you, as you gathered us in this place, in this blessed place, we ask you, Ya Allah, to bless the staff of MCC, to bless the, 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 the board members, to bless the founders. Ya Allah, we ask you to keep them under your supreme protection, to bless the Qari of this place, to, to bless the scholars of, of this place, to, to bless Ustazah Husay and her family, to bless everyone who teaches our Ummah, who tries to be accessible to our Ummah, who tries to be a mentor to our Ummah, 
who spends years and times and all the efforts and resources to pass the message of your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, we ask you to increase us in sincerity, to increase us in humility. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect us and to protect our children and to protect our parents. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive our sins and to elevate our status in dunya and the akhirah. Ya Allah, we ask you on the day of Jum'ah, Ya Rabb, Ya Allah, this is the day that you promised us that there is always be an hour and you promised us this hour, all our dua will be accepted and all our prayers will be answered and elevated. Ya Allah, make this hour an hour of acceptance, Ya Rabb. Make this hour an hour of acceptance. Subhanahu wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka tub ilayk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr, inna al-insana lafi khusr, illa alladhina amanu. وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته